Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you for your interest in my talk today and for coming along. It's always better than talking to an empty room. Um, just before I start, if there's anything that uh, strikes a chord with you or you'd like to get in touch, my contact details are on the slide here. Um, so feel free to also comment on my talk. Um, so I'll start by talking a little bit about why I might be qualified to get up here and bang on about the things that I'm going to today. Um, I've been working in and around government projects for some time now um, and have been trying to also promote and uh, implement the use of Agile on uh, government projects for quite some time. And I'm sure many of you have had experiences uh, with this over the course of your careers recently. Um, this is clearly where you end up at times. So what I'm going to talk about today is what are the steps that we have actually taken so far to implement Agile in government? Um, what have we learned so far? What steps do we still need to take? Which is sort of mostly uh, what my talk will be about today. And what can we all do to kind of improve the, the current environment that, that we work in? Bear with me for a second, technical problems. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, a short history of uh, where we are and what's happened so far today. Back in 2001, um, a few people got together and put something together called the Agile Manifesto, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This statement from the principles from the manifesto outlines very nicely what um, continuous delivery is all about. So many, many years later, as in 2015, we took what would be the first step uh, implementing Agile in government in Australia. Probably for half of that time between 2001 and 2015, I'd say a lot of us probably spent about half of that time working on the idea of Agile, on government projects, trying to implement Agile on our projects. And I think our experience has been very much that we're really pushing it up the hill to get Agile. So what has happened in the last little while is something that's very positive, and I, I want to remain positive about that today as much as I can. But I do want to talk a little bit about the history of what's happened in the last year or so. So in 2015, a couple of people got together and had a bit of a chin wag about how we might look at implementing Agile in government. Um, I don't probably need to tell you, most of you, who these people are. But at the time, this guy here was the Minister for Communications. And he got together with a few people, namely this other guy over here, and talked about how we might formalise the use of Agile in government. And what happened out of this? we got the DTO. So as, again, many of you are probably aware, um, the DTO was formed in 2015 with a mandate to implement Agile in government, amongst other things. Um, and as you can see, it was the build up of a, a team very quickly, and we started doing things that were a lot more Agile. We're endeavouring to do things that are a lot more Agile. I'll give you a second to digest this. But during that time, something wonderful happened, depending on your point of view on wonderful. I'm not necessarily talking about this guy getting the top job, um, but he did get the top job, and that gave the DTO even more emphasis in government and what we're trying to do. We had the Prime Minister of our country using the word agile. So for those of us who spent a lot of time in and around this and promoting this idea, that was a pretty exciting thing. And the other guy, he started talking about 
what I'm trying to talk about today, and that's the idea of continuous delivery, about biting off small chunks and delivering quickly and focusing on a very agile way of working. So by this time, obviously, the DTO itself's got some pretty heavy-hitting support in government. So those of us in and around this industry, this kind of quite nicely sums up where we got to. This guy, he, he thinks the whole idea rocks, and he's really over the moon about where we're at. This guy, well, he's, he's just relieved that it's all finally, it's all finally in place. This guy's just very smug about the whole idea. He's been telling you for years this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And this guy over here, well, he's, he's had a religious moment about it all. So a year or so later, where, where do we end up? So 2015, 2016 is a pretty short space of time, really, in the, in the scheme of things. Well, this is where we end up. We start getting statements like this. Now, I appreciate it's probably taken a bit of creative license with this. This is not directly um, referring to Agile in government or the DTO, but this really quite nicely reflects the mood um, a very short time later. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, this is also a quote from Veep, uh, the TV show. Um, and I heard the other. Uh, Armando Inucci, who created this show the other day, saying they came up with this quote or something very similar because they thought it was the most ludicrous thing that a government leader could ever say. <laughs> so here we are. Then we've got this guy. And um, obviously the language has changed quite a bit. He's almost checked out. So it's barely a year has gone by um, since we created possibly the most exciting thing that's happened in our industry and generally in trying to deliver projects in this country. And a very short time later, the two people or two of the most important people who are behind all of this, this is where we're at. Pretty disappointing. So, so I'm this guy. <laughs> Um, so, where are we at now? So I've obviously painted a, a picture that's not particularly rosy. Um, I make no bones about it. Uh, I was a, one of the biggest uh, pro, um, promoters of the DTR. I was very excited about what had happened. I've been doing this for a long time and to see something like that happen um, was, was very, very motivating. Having done this also for a very long time, you can get to a point where you're not so motivated anymore. Um, but that really did, um, you know, put some oomph into what we were trying to do. So to get to where we got to in the space, a very short space of time was pretty, pretty disappointing. Um, so where are we now? What I would like to say before I move on is that I haven't completely lost hope. Um, and we do, <laughs> sorry. This, this could be where we end up, right? So even the most professional people in the world, I'd like to include myself in that category, um, felt a bit like this, what's the point? Like, it's great, let's just move on. But the, the fact is, it is still on the agenda. So we do now have um, a, a different incarnation of the DTO, for if, if you're not aware of it which is now a fully formed government agency. Um, I don't want to dig too much into the history and the politics and the machinations of what's been going on in this space. Suffice to say, it's not pretty. Um, I'll let you research it for yourself. But we do have a government agency that does still have an agenda for the delivery of agile in government and for things like continuous delivery to be front and centre of the way, of the way we do our projects. The digital service standard still, still exists and is still being worked on. And um, we also have the digital marketplace. So that's certainly a really positive um, step in the way that buyers and sellers, as they like to refer to them, can engage with each other. And that is, um, that's that lost phone, sorry. Um, so yeah, so we have the digital marketplace, and, and that's a really good initiative for um, breaking down some of the barriers in the way that we engage with government and the way that government engages with us as vendors. 
So what I'd like to touch on a little bit now is um, what the, uh, the next steps or what I see the next step as being in this kind of journey of Agile and moving more towards a continuous delivery model. The first thing I want to talk about is procurement because I think that procurement is possibly the, the biggest catalyst to change and or a more positive space to be working in or as it stands now probably the biggest impediment to us um, facilitating ease of, ease of business with government um, as well as ease of uh, agile in the projects or on the projects that we, that we work on together. I've broken this down into the different types of procurement that I see happening or have seen happening over the years. And the first one I want to start with is traditional procurement. So this is the sort of age-old procurement that we've been um, using for years and years in government and as vendors. And that is the fixed cost model. So it will cost this much money, it will not be one cent more, it will not be one cent less. Um, it's a fixed scope, so we decide on a bunch of requirements and they're not going to change unless we go through a long and laborious change request process every time we want to do it. It's a fixed time frame, so we want this thing done yesterday and you will adhere to that or, or else, effectively. And generally it's a formal tendering process, so um, I'm sure many of you have experienced or even put, been responsible for putting together tenders. Um, they're pretty excruciating, to be honest and they don't reflect reality mostly. Um, and there's very, very little collaboration before engagement. So I think this quite nicely sums up what it looks like when you are going through a traditional, um, traditional procurement process. And I've uh, come to the conclusion that this is a what I would call the robotic method of procurement. So there is literally no interaction of any meaning and we uh, get to the end of the tendering process, we get awarded the work, and then it's on for young and old, effectively. Um, the second method of procurement um, that I wanted to cover off is what I call the standard method of procurement. And that's probably what we're, most of us are accustomed to um, working with today. Um, we're still looking around fixed costs, and I'll preface this by saying um, what we generally try and do, and that's speaking from uh, personal experience, is that we try and introduce agile practices and agile ideas into this procurement method the best we can, um, and, and in, uh, I guess educate the, um, the client before engagement around how we want to work and how we think we should work, and try and get a little bit of buy-in on that. So fixed costs, so we can work with a fixed budget. Um, ideally, we get some sense of what that budget is before we go into the procurement process. Um, we, we have what I would consider a not very variable time frame. So we'll talk about, uh, we'll look at the requirements and we'll say, mm, this, is, this is a lot to be trying to deliver by you know, the end of the financial year, which always seems to be um, a, a common theme. Um, we don't think it's, really viable, we'll get some buy-in on that, but realistically it's not that terrible at all once, once uh, you get started. The method of procurement is generally a request for proposal or RFP. Um, so reasonably well documented, but probably let, maybe slightly less formal than um, a, a, a full tender. And you get the ability to have some collaboration before engagement, so um, you're at least talking to a person, um, you are discussing some of these things around your ideas of using Agile, you're discussing some of the ideas around the time frame. This is what I would uh, suggest reflects that at, at the end of the day. <laughs> so obviously what I'm trying to say there is it's all nice, we play nice together, and then ultimately when it comes to the crunch, that's where we end up. Classic client vendor relationship, very adversarial. Um, I'd like to refer this one as the synth, the synth method. So if you don't know, this is another TV reference, this is the humans. So you feel like you're talking to a person, but they're not really quite there. 
Um, finally, the, uh, the ultimate procurement method. Um, the agile procurement method of actually having a variable cost. So we, and when I say variable cost, we could be talking about um, budgeting for a project based on a sprint-based pricing, something like that. Um, or as we've had some experience with recently, we tackle a certain component of work, so a small chunk of work, and we get asked to quote on that. So it gives some indication of how we, how we quote. Um, and some indication of the sort of time um, required for a, a fairly well-known and discreet piece of work. We definitely have variable scope because we're working agile and we're agreeing to a very high level set of requirements, but we all know that they're going to change and we're all willing to collaborate and work together to, to see that they that what we get at the end of the day is what we really want. Um, we have a variable time frame because it's iterative and continuous, isn't it? It's agile, that's the whole idea of doing it this way. Um, and it usually starts in, the, in a more formal setting um, that we're accustomed to in working with government um, for something usually called like a request for information. So it's about, I want to know about you as a vendor, um, I want to know about your team, I want to know about the real people that are going to be working on this project and I want to know a little bit about how you do things, <clears throat> potentially how much you are going to actually spent or how much it's going to cost to do some sort of certain bits of work. And then you, and through that you have some meaningful collaboration for the engagement. So I actually, I mean, you actually get together, you sit in a room and you talk through some of the requirements, you meet each other, you try and build a little bit of rapport um, between the teams and understand who you're dealing with and see if there's a, a good dynamic of working together. Because ultimately you're going to be working together for the next, what, six weeks, six months, six years, who knows. Um, and generally, you, you can sense um, whether you're going to be compatible with somebody on the work front, you know, within a fairly short space of time. So it's really um, important to be able to do these sort of things. Um, what would I call this? Well, it's normal human interaction. So it's complete common sense, right? So exactly like agile um, methods and practices, it's common sense. It's how we should be working together. Um, not some construct because of some outdated policy or procurement method or whatever. It really is um, the only way we should be working together to um, get value for money out of what are effectively government projects that the taxpayer is paying for um, and, and actually have an enjoyable experience in, in, in delivering these projects. I mean, we all turn up to work every day. Um, you know, we want to get paid, but it's nice to be able to go to work and feel like you're doing something meaningful and, and you're actually enjoying working with the people that you work with, whether they be your colleagues or whether they be the client that you're working for. Okay, so that's, that's procurement uh, in a nutshell. Um, as I said before, probably um, one of the most important things to get right. I, I, I strongly believe that... Um, if you get it wrong at the procurement stage, it's, it's going to carry on right through. And I've seen projects where two years down the track, um, you get, everything is just not right and you know exactly why that is and it's because you didn't start right and it was all because of the way that, the, that it was set up in the, in, the, in the first place. So what do I mean by breaking the cycle? Um, what I've done here is try and compare the methods of delivery, uh, project delivery, to the methods of procurement. So it's slightly unscientific, but um, ultimately we've got um, the very traditional methods of procurement and they tend to go with the very traditional methods of delivery, which are um, very discrete phases in the project, usually with what you call probably gates between each one of the phases. You have to finish one before you can start the other. Um, this thing goes on for a very protracted period of time generally, obviously depending on the scope of the project. And then at the end of the project, we have this big bang launch. So it's, I mean, everyone's done it. We spend months and months and months and then we have this incredibly stressful point in time where it all goes live. And as I've tried to <laughs> demonstrate here, it's a bit of a big bang. Um, and then what generally happens is that we go into a fixed cycle, what I'd call a fixed cycle. We're just continually going through and I'll, I'll say fixing things that we didn't get right the first time, not necessarily bugs, because ultimately in these sort of projects, what happens is that um, a client might say to the vendor, well, that's not how we expected it to work. Um, and you're going to pay for it, not us, because you should have known. 
Um, and generally it's because of the specifications at the beginning were just fanciful and they didn't reflect reality. But we never really addressed that right throughout this whole project. And we just go into this never ending fix cycle. Um, the second um, project delivery cycle would be matching up with the standard procurement method. And that is, um, we have the standard, um, we have a delivery method where some of these phases overlap. So throughout discovery, and I'll call it discovery because in the previous one I called it define or definition, which is a, kind of a little bit more um, uh, absolute, like it, it is going to be this. Whereas what we're doing here is a little bit more collaborative and we're going through a discovery process where we're working together to, to discover what it is that we want to be building. Um, we also incorporate some design into that phase, so those um, phases sort of blend into each other a little bit, and then that can sometimes move into the development cycle as well, where we're actually iterating a little bit on the design, or iterating a little bit on some of the requirements, or prototyping the requirements. But then at the end, we generally have this sort of um, formal delivery cycle where we say, right, we're done, everything's good, we've built everything we said we were going to. Um, and then we have a, a big bang launch, or a smaller bang launch, as I've got here. <clears throat> and then we move into, um, and I've added change and enhance here, so it's a little bit more fluffy than a fixed cycle where everything's a bug and everything's wrong. But we do go into a, a kind of never-ending change and enhancement um, program where we just keep, I guess, adding to the um, original body of work, which is in a way a little bit more agile, and if you get it right, um, I'm not saying this is this method is wrong by any stretch. It's kind of the way that we work generally, and I'm sure the way a lot of you do also work. Um, but that and that change in hand cycle can be quite good, and it you know if, as long as you've got a good dynamic going. So these projects can be a good outcome. I tend to think that the previous one, the traditional, it never ends well, um, but but this method is is manageable. And then finally, the agile cycle. So in, in the um, spirit of continuous delivery, and the theme for today, um, it is a cycle of delivery, shorter delivery cycles. And I call it delivery because ultimately that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to deliver functionality, trying to deliver design, we're trying to deliver components all of the time um, in small chunks. And, and we're going through this iterative cycle where we are constantly deploying that as well. Okay, so that covers off um, the project delivery methods. What I wanted to just touch on briefly now is a little bit about DevOps. Now, I'm going to preface this also with saying I'm not qualified to be talking about any level of detail around DevOps, but um, I have had some good exposure to it through the great team that I do work with at Previous Next, just a small plug there, um, because we've managed to put in place some pretty good um, well, DevOps in infrastructure, and we've achieved um, what I think is true DevOps. So it's, it's more than just the tools and the infrastructure, it's also about the people and the way we work together and what we're doing to support um, each other in, in this continuous delivery phase. We should get rid of that phone. Um, so the first thing, which I sort of just touched on, is around communication and collaboration. So DevOps is, as I said, more than just the infrastructure and the tools. It is about how you collaborate with each other. It's how cross-functional teams work together and different disciplines actually interact with each other, all in order to support um, this idea of continuous delivery. So, um, is that the phone? <laughs> Do you mind putting on silent if you, that's okay. It keeps ringing. Um, so yeah, as I said, truly cross-functional teams um, working together under the banner of DevOps. Um, working together and actually understanding the business goals and the requirements for the project. So that's not just the client or the project manager or the scrum master or whoever it is um, being responsible for the requirements, it's everyone. So it's everyone from the client right through to the SysOps team, all having a really clear understanding of what we're trying to do here. Because if we're working in small, discrete, iterative, continuous delivery cycles, it's really important that we know the bigger picture and that everyone understands the bigger picture. Um, when they're, maybe when they're building a small piece of functionality or they're building a new um, module for whatever it is that we're, you're doing, it's really helpful. And I think you end up with a much better, high quality outcome if um, everyone understands those things. 
uh, obviously um, supportive of a rapid delivery approach. So as I was sort of just alluding to there, we all need to understand that we're building things quickly, we're building things, um, we're, we're taking small chunks and we're trying to get it out the door um, to production um, in, in a quicker way. Um, everybody needs to support that method and that includes, or well, most importantly, needs to include the client. They need to understand what we're trying to achieve here, not that we're just doing bits and pieces at a time and, they, and they've got some unfinished product. They need to be bought into this whole idea that um, we're building out MVP type releases and we're going to do that quickly and we need their feedback um, uh, that lines up with that. And most importantly as well, um, everyone's focused on quality. When you're working quickly, with short periods of time, it's easy to potentially make mistakes, so um, we need to focus on making sure we do things correctly and things are properly checked and when we're releasing them, they are fit for purpose. Um, so some of the things that do support that um, first idea of communication and collaboration are our development practices. So I won't go into too much detail here, but we, we need to be having um, well, we need development practices that are iterative. Um, they need to be test driven, so that's um, back to the idea of quality. We need to have um, an ability to test things on the fly that don't necessarily require or rely on an individual having to test things or doing full regression testing all of the time. We still obviously need you know, real people looking at it and seeing how um, it works. But without a test-driven approach, this whole um, idea is likely to fail. And I've put this in, one in here because um, I think this is really important as well. It comes back to the idea of people understanding the goals and the business requirements, and that is that it's the whole the development is vision-driven. So if you're working on code or you're working on a module or you're doing sysops work, you need to understand why are we all here? Why are we working on this project? What's the whole point of this project? I think it's important for motivation, but it's also important for people to um, get it right effectively. And then finally, the tools and infrastructure um, that supports DevOps. I'm talking about, obviously, DevOps tools. Um, things like source control, I think that's pretty obvious to anyone. Um, test automation, again, to support the test-driven approach to development. Um, continuous integration, being able to integrate the code ready for deployment um, at any point in time. Um, be able to do that continuous deployment at any point in time, make it less of a big bang and something that we could do daily, multiple times daily, ten times weekly, whatever it is, we need to be able to do that with ease. And also put the client's mind at ease about that stuff as well. So I think a lot of clients are accustomed to that big bang idea. So everything has to be done at 3 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday and you, you can't um, possibly launch things um, in the middle of some big policy launch or whatever it is, is trying to just um, get rid of that whole idea that everything needs, you know, people need to be used like some kind of military operation because it's not. Um, and then, of course, infrastructure as code. And again, I'm far from qualified to be talking about that, but um, this is something that our, our guys have really nailed uh, in a big way. Um, I'll mention something I want to about that in a second, but um, it, that, that is really important because the, the easier the tools are to use and the easier it is to deploy these environments and get things up and running, the easier it is to do what I'm suggesting we should all be doing. That's ultimately the goal, right? Um, so the final thing I just want to touch on today um, that I think is really important for this and again, probably one of the most important things are after procurement, look, everything's important, right? Um, commercial and community support for this concept of continuous delivery and this the whole idea of supporting Agile. What do we do to make it happen? Well, um, I'm going to start with this first one because that's something that I'm most used to, and that is being more assertive as a vendor. So in this environment that we work in, I'm not talking about being adversarial or being um, difficult to work with, I'm talking about being assertive around the procurement methods and just um, pointing out that, especially in a traditional procurement environment, that they, it is a ridiculous way to engage with each other. And that um, the more of us who push back on that kind of method and try and um, at least bring it to a more standard procurement method like I outlined before and then ideally a much more agile procurement method, the better it's going to be for all of us. And by all of us I also mean government clients 
um, because we're going to end up working together in a lot more effective way and we're all going to enjoy it a lot more than maybe we do now. Um, which comes to being more supportive as, as a government, government client. I appreciate that um, we do have limitations, there's policies, there's procedures, um, at different levels of government, some of them haven't quite caught on to this idea of Agile yet or different ways of procurement, but I think it's happening quite quickly through things like the digital marketplace that, um, that we can work together like that and um, if there's any way that they can champion that idea internally with their own procurement people, then we definitely should be doing it. I think policy reform and standards sort of goes without saying. Um, and I'm hoping that the, um, the, the DTA is a, a really strong vehicle for this and that they're pushing that through and setting an example for all levels of government. Obviously the digital service standard is a really good kind of um, benchmark to be working from, but um, policy change at the highest level is obviously critical to seeing this work. Um, easier engagement platforms, um, I'm probably mostly referring to the digital marketplace here. That's definitely a, a better platform to engage. My understanding is that um, ultimately the digital marketplace will replace a lot of the existing panels um, and will be kind of the go-to place for people to engage around projects. And that they, um, that it'll also be easier for smaller businesses to actually get on that platform. Traditionally, being on a panel is a pretty laborious exercise that requires a business to have been in business for uh, however long and have all sorts of financial records. There's plenty of small, agile, very good, very talented um, businesses out there that I think um, the government's starting to recognise they should be engaging with instead of big dinosaur organisations um, I'm not going to name, but um, uh, caused catastrophic outcomes like things like the census and the like, so work that out for yourself. Um, so the community discussion, well, that's what we're doing now. So I think it's really important that we talk about this stuff at conferences, whether it be technical conferences or agile conferences or whatever. I think the way that um, government and the private sector engages with each other and how they do that in a more agile way is really important. Um, it's important for um, delivering value for the people of Australia, not to get political or anything. Um, and then open source tools and infrastructure. So um, just again, using the example of what um, some of our guys that have done at the previous Next is that we've started open sourcing some of the tools that we are using for DevOps. And um, well, I mean, we, we're obviously already very accustomed to that in the Drupal community, but we're also doing that um, on, on the DevOps front. And um, some of the stuff we've done around containerization on um, hosting and the like, um, is great and uh, you know, I think it's something we should be very proud of in doing that and I strongly encourage any other business who has the maturity in that space to be doing exactly the same thing. So, just to quickly summarise. Uh, a more open approach to procurement, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we want to change the project delivery life cycle because I think, um, at least in those traditional methods, I don't, I don't believe any of those work. Um, so the more we move into this, uh, a more agile standard type approach and then a truly agile approach, the better we'll all, we'll all be. Um, in, enable DevOps driven environments. On, you, you, can't, you can't create a uh, continuous delivery environment if you don't have DevOps. Um, it kind of goes without saying, it's just too clunky. Um, and causes too much stress for people, and it doesn't enable that really quick, continuous deployment um, method. So uh, if, if you don't have that in place, or you can't get that in place, then you, you, you're gonna be struggling. Commercial and community support, I think I've talked enough about that. Um, and overall, I think taking this approach, which again, I'm probably repeating myself, but it, it's much more conducive um, to success and, and definitely a better working environment for everyone. So, um, I think that just about wraps it up. Are there any questions? Yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah, thanks, Jason, for your presentation today. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the digital marketplace. I was just wondering, as a vendor, do you have any constructive criticism about? Things that the digital marketplace could do better at the moment? Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I think it's, 
I think the thing that it needs to be um, used most for is ease of procurement. So changing the procurement methods from that traditional procurement through to that uh, more agile procurement method. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be invited to um, a feedback or a, um, a sort of user testing on the digital marketplace um, some time back. And that was the feedback I actually gave because we, we did spend a lot of time in that um, session talking about the uh, size of the headings and the colours and things like that. Um, but I, I did suggest that uh, to be focusing on those sort of things is completely missing the point. So um, the digital marketplace needs to be transformational in that it's transformational for procurement. It's not just a, a shiny new website that makes it easier for you to upload a proposal. Yep. Uh, just in regards to being able to engage a DevOps process inside of an existing organization with existing um, governance structures, mm. what would you say um, are the minimum requirements to the change to existing business operations to enable uh, DevOps style delivery and what would be your recommendations to conduct uh, that kind of change plan? Yeah, that's, that's difficult, especially if it's a really rigid environment and especially if you've got your own infrastructure. I think the first step needs to be the idea that you outsource the infrastructure and um, not in an outsource kind of dirty word kind of way, but um, in a, a way that's collaborative with your um, the vendor that you're working with uh, and that they help you set that infrastructure up. So obviously moving from things like internal server networks to cloud hosting infrastructure and then um, engaging the help of someone who's obviously experienced in DevOps um, and using open source tools if possible to do that. So, um, but internally, yeah, the, um, it, there's a lot of process change and change around the delivery cycle and agile mindset that you need to be working on. Hopefully, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how do you manage the integrity and proving um, questions that might come up um, through more of an agile procurement method? Not the traditional yeah. systems are panaceas and solving those, but mm. that's, that's one of the questions that's going to come up. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be flippant about it, but I think generally those things are, are a bit sort of paranoid around those sort of things. I, I, think, it's, I think it's just as easy to, be, um, to, to have those things in place um, through an agile method as it is a traditional one. I'm not sure why traditional trumps agile if you are using things like the digital marketplace, everything's well documented, um, you're having reasonably formal meetings and your communications with each other are, um, are solid on that front. Um, in terms of probity, I mean, if, if we're talking about um, someone getting awarded a, a tender that um, you know was not necessarily above board because they knew each other and it was all stacked in their favour, um, I think that could happen on any in any of those methods. And to be honest, I think traditional procurement lends itself more to that happening than Agile does because um, you don't have a really open conversation going. I mean, the traditional methods where you where you literally do not talk to a single person, you submit your proposal and never hear back, um, yeah, I, I question that sometimes. Great. More questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. And again, feel free to get in touch with me if you have any other questions or you want to comment. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day.